Open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 1. We're in a, a study of the book of James, but I paused a moment to do a short series. I said Corinthians. A short series on divine wisdom. Uh, being, uh, flapping back and forth. First Corinthians, I'm looking at the first chapter, verses 18 through 21. Now, we started this, sub, we started this lesson in James 3, 13 through 18, where James introduced us to two spheres of wisdom. You remember that? Two, and if, if, you, if you remember that, it's okay. But he introduced us to two spheres of wisdom, um, we call it cosmos. We call it cosmos diabolicus. Diabolicus is the Greek word for the devil, and cosmos is world for is a word for uh, the world, and so we call we he referred to it as earthly. He referred to it. In James uh, 15, 315, uh, earthly, natural, and what's this last word? Demonic. Demonic. That's cosmos diabolical. This is run, that, uh, that's a system of wisdom in the world that's run by Satan. <laughs> Over on this side, this is the God side. The God side, we call divine wisdom. That This comes from the Bible. And he referred to this one as wisdom from above in verse 17. Now, that's in James now, wisdom from above. And God operates that. In this system, that's where it is. You're either in one or the other, or you've drew a lot of information from this. Now you're trying to get rid of it over here. This is old man stuff, and here is new man stuff. So we, we talked about that. This is, we studied this, this subject in James, the third chapter, 13 through 18. This is verse 15. This is verse 17 in your Bible. Now, and so I don't know what lesson this is, but we, we've done a couple of studies on this. And so tonight we're looking at the same subject by Paul. Uh, Paul is writing about it in 1 Corinthians 1, 18 uh, through 25. Here's what he says. He writes about it, by the way. He writes about it in the first chapter of Corinthians in the first chapter of Romans, that would be well worth your time <clears throat> on this subject. He says, for the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness. Watch that word now. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Then he quotes Isaiah. If you have a study Bible, verse 19 comes from Isaiah. If you have a cross reference. Isaiah 29, for it is written in the scriptures, Old Testament, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. That's my subject tonight. He's going to refer to this system over here. Over here, he's going to call this the wisdom of the wise. The wisdom of the wise. <clears throat> and the cleverness of the clever. I will set aside. Now look, he said, I'm going to destroy that. And the cleverness of the clever. He gives it two titles. Now, now, now pay attention because he asked four rhetorical questions in verse 20. Four. Here, here's how they go. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? 
Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? Those are rhetorical questions. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. That's Romans 1. God was well pleased through the foolishness, there's our word again, of the message preached, that's a public proclamation, that's, that's the public square, preaching in the public square of exchange of ideas over these two spheres. Through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs, and Greeks, Gentiles, search for wisdom. He takes this whole world of humanity and puts them into two categories at this point, Jews and Gentiles. But we preach, there's our word again, Caruso. But we, that's public, that's public square preaching. That's going to the public for debate. Challenging, this is this group of people over here going to this group and challenging. Where is the four debate, the four debate questions? Are you with me? There's four debate questions. And that's this word preach means to Caruso. It means this group is going to go over here into a public arena and discuss that view. In 2 Corinthians 5, it's referred to becoming ambassadors of Christ to the world. Ambassadors. That's what we all are. We're all ambassadors. <clears throat> Listen, here's what I hear out of the church over here. Now, they should have all the answers to debate this one. They got all the answer to all of their questions comes from the wisdom from above. Not from God. The problem is, these people here don't study the Bible enough to go into the public arena and debate simple stuff. You got it. You've got to be connected with the wisdom from above. The wisdom from above will always win this argument over here. Always. Because this one runs, if everything that the devil does up here runs off from lies, right? John, the eighth chapter, everything that runs off from here runs off from truth. Truth will always win in the, in the exchange of ideas. They may not accept it, but it will always win. The Jew asks for signs, the Greek seeks for wisdom. There's, there's the wisdom of the wise business. But we preach Christ, there's our word preach again, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jew, that's a stumbling block message. To the Gentile, that message is foolishness. So all of a sudden, I've got two groups over here. I've got the Jews that have the Bible written by God from above as truth who are caught up in the cosmic system of lies. And I have the Gentiles. This group shouldn't be over here. That group should be over here. They ought to be over here in Galatians, the third chapter, verse 27. There is no law, and 28, no more Jews, no more Gentiles. We are one in Christ. No longer, no longer male, no longer female, equality in Christ. The Jew had the Bible, a canon of Scripture, knew all about the Christ, but they threw it away to come over here. That was the Jew Jesus ministered to in the first century, and Paul himself. But we preach Christ. We go to the public arena. This is Caruso, K-E-R-U-S-S-O. -S -S That's the word preach used in this text. We go to the public arena to debate. The issue. 
Now, they're not, we're not interested in debating all of this thing, but we're willing to come into the arena and tell them why they're lost and need to be saved, why the Bible trumps everything, why God is superior. I mean, when we go to that arena, we preach the gospel of great salvation. That's the first question that has to be answered. Not where did Cain get his wife? But we preach Christ crucified to the Jew. That message is a stumbling block. To the Gentile, that message is foolishness. Verse 24. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, i.e. Gentiles, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. In the Greek text, there is no verb. There is no R, A-R-E, in the Greek text. No verb in that sentence. And that leaves you with a pretty powerful idea. But, you know, it's part of verse 22. For indeed, they, the Jews ask for science, the Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach in the public arena. Christ crucified to the Jew, that message is stumbling, to the Gentiles is foolish. But to those who are called, to those who believe that message of the gospel, that Jesus Christ died for your sins, your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. Listen to me now. When you believe that, you get saved. When you don't believe that, you don't get saved. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. No one. And no religion in the whole wide world can take you to God except through Jesus Christ. So that's verse 24. Now here's verse 5. Because of the foolishness, there's a key word again, because of the foolishness of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. That's why we can go to the public arena and argue the truth of the word of God and win every time that argument. Because, listen, the bottom line, no matter what their discussion is, it all comes from God because he created all of this out of bara, out of nothing but his essence. All of the creation, the Hebrew word bara, the whole creation is the work of God. That's Romans 1 in the New Testament. So let's pause a moment, and we're going to get into this study tonight, and you're going to need the ministry of the Holy Spirit to carry you through this study. Now listen to me. The Bible, the Bible you have in your hand right now, around the table next to you, I want you to understand that this Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. The unbelieving world don't understand it. They pick the Bible up, they can't get a clue. Because they're, they're spiritually dead. And you could go spend a, a whole day in a funeral home and go to every room and talk to the person in the casket. Any of them going to get saved? Uh, not, none of them. They're dead. This is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. You can't learn it, nor can you live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. So how do I get out of carnality and into spirituality? Because the Holy Spirit indwells me and made my body the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's how we get back into the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit in Bible study as well as in our life. Decisions. That's how that works. So I'm going to give you a moment in your priesthood, I'm going to give you a moment to confess sin if necessary. It could be mental attitude sins. It could be sins of the tongue or overt sins. I'm going to give you a moment to confess sin. You do it in privacy. You do it in silence. But you do do it because you'll get absolutely nothing from this study without it. Is not an exercise in human wisdom, but divine wisdom. This is the sphere of divine wisdom. 
And so, our Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way, our visitors as well, to study the Bible with us. And I pray the Holy Spirit would minister truth to their souls, the truth that sets us free from the cosmic system of lies, John 8, 32, as well as stimulate our growth and bring us to places of peace in decisions we have to make in our daily lives that are compatible with the will of God. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> now, I want you to look down to the third, the third paragraph on your paper, if you would, with me. <clears throat> when we talk about the sphere of wisdom, divine wisdom, wisdom from above, it is God's system of divine wisdom, or biblically, that we're talking about. Where does divine wisdom come from? It comes from the Bible. The Bible. The Bible. And it often comes in elementary forms. You hear the gospel and you believe it. <clears throat> and then as a newborn babe, you desire the sincere milk of the word of God. First Peter 2.2. 2. <clears throat> then you begin to grow in the word under the milk, the, the concept of all that salvation has provided you. Then you begin to take in the meat doctrines of the word of God. And you become more than sufficient for every task that comes your way. Think about that. More than sufficiently prepared for everything that comes your way. <clears throat> Second Timothy, third chapter 16 and 17 tells you that. All scripture is God breathed inhaled and exhaled in your Christian life. And it's profitable, beneficial to your life. And part of that is to equip you, to equip you for life's decisions. How important is that? Now, I put on your paper, notice I put on your paper, John 21, 25. And I said, you should read that. So I'm going to read that to you. This is what this says. This is, then listen, look up here. This is this side, not that side. This is, the, this is the earthly side. This is the heavenly side on earth. Watch this. Now listen to this. This is John 21, 25. And there are many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would have been written. Now, when I came to the South, I went UAB. I was curious about the person called Jesus Christ, so I went to the library. <coughs> Ask the lady at the desk, you've heard this before, but I asked the lady at the desk if she could steer me to some place in the library to find out something about this man called Jesus Christ, because I thought he was a swear word. So it was kind of like news to me that he was actually a person. <clears throat> she took me back into this humongous library at UAB, into a section reached up and pulled out one book. <laughs> out of thousands upon thousands of books, she pulled out one book. It said on the front of it, B-I-B-L-E. I didn't know what that was. Man, I figured it's some kind of religious book. I checked it out. She told me where I could look in the book in the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the front part, and she showed me where I could find it, take it home and read it about the life of Christ. One little book. 
I checked a lot of books out of that library over the course of my time. Only one book, and the one book that I checked out as that little lady led me back that absolutely changed my life forever, and it was called the B-I-B-L-E. I think that's what John had in mind when he wrote, and there are many other things which Jesus did which if they had been written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not be able to contain the book, the books that would have been written. He only lived 30-some years on earth, people. Right? Now, when I read that, and I read it often, I understand that. I mean, that book changed my life, and it still is. I mean, I fell in love with that book. Spent the rest of my life studying it, teaching it. A lot of books you can pull out of the library. This book will go to heaven with you. Not in the written print, but in your heart print. That word that's printed not with the ink, but by the Holy Spirit of God in your heart will go with you to heaven. It's the only possession that you have on earth you can take with you. The only one. Why would you neglect it? Why would you not want to take that with you as much as you can? Because it's going to tell you all about where you're going. Wouldn't you want to know where you're going? I would. But in the meantime, it tells you everything about where you are. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to know where you really are? Really? Where you really are? I'm just saying that sounds pretty good to me. Paul addressed the same doctrine that we're talking about in 1 Corinthians 1, 2, and 3. In our lesson text, Paul called God's system the wisdom of God. In 1 Corinthians 21 and 24, he called it the wisdom of God. Satan's system is called in this text the wisdom of the world in 1 Corinthians 1, 20 and 21. When you read back on this, you will see that. These two spheres of wisdom in the world are very clear today in the United States, both in our politics, in our education, and in our theology. Now, this has always been true. But it is, it is clear as a bell today. The assault on the five divine institutions is just one example of the war between these two spheres of wisdom for the minds and hearts of Americans. For example, the divine institution of employment is being fought between socialism, where the government welfare and taxes give you a free ride against capitalism, the free enterprise system of employment that the Bible supports that comes by inspiration and perspiration out of the production of workers. It's hard for me to believe that America has come to the place where we're considering electing a socialist to run our free enterprise system that has been world renowned. The internet, like the newspaper, radio, and television, has changed the speed and the cost to reach an audience for the exchange of ideas between these two spheres of wisdom. That's amazing to me in my lifetime. Christians have caught Christians in this church, among many, have caught the vision of this ministry opportunity like in our church, John and Chris Dyer and their team. They have a team that's from all over the United States that work with them on pushing our material out across the world. That's amazing to me. Tonight in my lesson, I want to talk about four aspects of the danger of the attack by the wisdom of the wise of the world against the wisdom of the word of God. And we're in the battle for our life today, believe me. Now, it's not the first battle, but it's ours, isn't it? 
because it's in our generation. This is a battle we've got to fight and we've got to win it. It's our generation. Every generation fights this fight. Every generation of believers fights this fight. We've got to fight this fight. Point number one. The Christian church has always been the voice of the wisdom of God's word to the world. The church, the Christian church from its inception, Pentecost, all the way. The church of Jesus Christ has always been. And listen, it is the lone voice. It is the lone voice of the wisdom of God's word to the world. Without this voice of the church of truth. Without this voice of truth regarding the wisdom of God, there would only be one voice, and that voice would be controlled by Satan. You understand it? How do I know that? Because these two spheres, this is where it is. We know this from reading John 12, 31, where the devil is called the God of this world, or 14, 30, or 16, 11 out of the book of John, or in 1 John 5, 19, where he says he is the God of this world, Satan. Paul warns that the wisdom of the wise of the world consider spiritual truth as foolish. Now listen, I tell you that because when you go to the public arena, that could be a coffee shop or a next door neighbor or your guy who does your laundry or your dry cleaner or whatever, that, that arena right there is very important to us. The public arena, Caruso, is where you preach. The word Caruso is not the word evangelism. It's the word to go to the public square where people meet and shop and do things in their everyday normal life and share the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. Whether they accept it or not, we sow it. It's up to them to believe it. It's not up to me to force them to believe it or to hook and break their arm if they don't. To share the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right there, every day in the public arena, there's an exchange of ideas. Everybody's talking about something. You can walk in and meet a stranger and, and have a conversation. Right? Yeah, about a lot of things. You can talk about the weather. You can talk about football. You can talk about grandkids. You can exchange pictures, you know. I see ladies all the time pulling out pictures. I know what they're talking about. They're going over. They got all kinds of people in their family in that little, right? They're showing pictures, and they're talking. What are we? We're, listen, that opportunity there is to grab where life is really at and, and have an exchange of ideas have an exchange of ideas. We are the voice of the truth of God. We are the voice of the truth of God. And, and listen, you need to know that when you go to the public arena and share the truth of God's word, their first reaction is to think it's foolish. It was mine. The first time I heard the gospel, I went, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. A guy 2,000 years ago died on a cross, was buried and raised on the third day, and if I believe that, my life is going to be changed, and if I believe that, I'm going to, when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. You talk about a fairy tale. You talk about a fairy tale story. To me, that was absolutely a fairy tale story. How could that possibly be that somebody died 2,000 years ago could have that kind of effect upon our life? Well, the secret in that, how we can have a present day, is the power of the resurrection. What did that mean? See? But when I first heard that, and listen, I heard that over the next three years, and it didn't get any better, in my opinion. It boils down to whether you believe it or not. It's a simple thing. There's no way. I studied it rationally, empiricistic. I looked at it every way it could be looked at. And the only way it could be accepted is by faith. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It's a gift from God. If that's a fairy tale, I'm in. Because this one 
is, has, been, has proved itself in my life over and over and over and over and over and over again. I've seen, I've, listen, I have prayed according to the will of God, and I have seen God do things. I've seen God do things that we would classify a miracle too many times to say that this is not a real deal. Too many times. There's not that many coincidences in the world that big for the average Joe. Right? We're, listen, just the average Joe, or in my case, the average Ron. Paul, listen to me. Paul used the word for foolish in this Bible. Listen. It's used in verse 18, it's used in verse 20, verse 21, 23, and 25. It dominates the subject. We always look for markers. The word foolishness dominates the subject. The word is Moriah. Do you know what that comes from? You know what, how we use this word? Moron. This is the word moron. That's the word foolish. Now, that word, listen, that word is normally used with mental, mental disability, right? Then it's used in a slang way to talk about something that's really stupid, right? Here's how the world uses what we have to share in this, their first reaction. So you don't be shocked by their first reaction when they think that we're foolish, that our message is foolish. But our job is to sow the truth, and the truth will win. And that's all we have. We don't have a big stick. That's not our job. Our job is not to convince. Our job is to make a good, clear argument on why the gospel should be believed. And leave the rest alone, because it, can only, it can't be accepted by rationalism or empiricism or philosophical ideas. It has to be done by faith. In the bottom line, you believe it or you don't believe it. If you believe it, you'll find out that it's true in your life. You're going to see God do things in your life that you go like, whoa. And it's going to be done in the invisible world of your faith. In the invisible, it won't be. And you're going to know it. You're going to know it. And listen. The icing on the cake is one day, like all people, we will die. And the moment your spirit leaves your life, the moment your soul leaves your life, leaves your body behind, you're going to know for absolute certainty in the physical realm that only you can believe by faith now, you will know it in the physical realm as absolute truth. Because to be absent from your body is to be present with the Lord, and that's a promise from of 2 Corinthians, right? 6 through 8. But in the meantime, you've got to believe everything by faith. You've got to take God at his word. See, faith is taking God at his word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Romans 10, 17 is taking God at his word. Listen, the character of God is always on, the, uh, always on call for your life. The essence, God is omnipotent. God is omniscient. He's all of these things. He's sovereign. He's righteous. He's, he's all of these things. And every time you, you call upon him, he manifests one of those to you. He's always manifesting himself to you. You will, you will experience his omniscience, his, his omnipresence, his omnipotence, his sovereignty. And after a while, you just want it all the time. Like you can't live without it. You get addicted to God. And that's a good thing. Now, I'm telling you, it's been a wonderful thing in my life. You see, foolishness, when Satan comes over here and, and dialogues in this, the first thing he's going to call you is all of that's foolishness. Right? Bunch of morons. We're a bunch of morons. 
You know what God calls us? Ambassadors. <laughs> the devil calls us morons. God calls us ambassadors for Christ. But the world thinks that we're a bunch of morons, that we don't have enough sense to come out of the rain. Truth of the matter, sometimes we, we know we could come out of the rain. We stay there because we know it comes from God. So this idea of Moriah dominates our passage. In verse 18, he says, for the word of the cross, <laughs> the word of the cross. And we know what cross that is, don't we? The cross of Jesus Christ. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. One of 13 judicial punishments of Adam sin upon the human race, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It's the power of God. When you believe the gospel, when you believe the gospel, you get the power of God. The power of God saves you, like Romans 1.16. See, this one here, this is, this is 1 Corinthians 1.18. The same thing is said in Romans 1.16, one I quote all the time. In, in 1 Corinthians one twenty three, he says, we preach, and that's our word caruso, that's the verb, we preach Christ crucified. See, a moment ago he said the cross, now he says crucified. We preach Christ crucified. To the Jews it's a stumbling block, this message, but to, and to the Gentiles it's foolishness. Here's a second point I want to make. Now, before I open up that second point, before I open up the second point, let, let me make a point that's not on your paper. I want to be sure you understand this. Listen to me. Listen to me clearly now because a lot of people get confused here with Paul. Paul is not attacking learning nor intelligence, but rather stating that you cannot be saved by them. they will not get you to heaven. <laughs> There's nothing wrong in them unless you put your trust that that's the way, that's the answers to life if for time and eternity. See, I met professors in my life they did not believe that God was the answer. They believed that intelligence was intellect. Intellect was the answer. And they were going to die believing that. Then it's too late, Luke 16. The rich man in hell tells them, send somebody back to tell my five brothers this is a real deal. Now, point number two. So don't think I'm talking about not, 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 being part of the learning curve and doing all that. Human IQ and worldly wisdom are never the basis of perception of spiritual truth, no matter how wise. See, I thought it was interesting because Paul had been out talking to some of the most intelligent people on the earth in the Greek world. And he called them the wisdom of the wise. He was talking to those like at Athens and places like that. In Corinthians 1, 19 and 20, Paul quotes Isaiah 29, 14. He said, it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. And he asked four questions. Where is the wise man? When I read this in the 60s, I went through the book of Corinthians with my pastor. I went to the public arena. I went to the public arena, formed an organization called Teen Crusades with Rick Hughes, and we went to the public arena in the 60s. We went to college campuses in the 60s. 
And boy, we had a lot of trouble in the 60s. We had a lot of trouble in America. America was really volatile in the 60s, if you, if you know anything about that. We went to the college campuses and debated the professors. We didn't care what they want to talk about. They can pick their subject and they could come out. And they did. We went to Kansas State. We went to University of Michigan, Indiana. I mean, we went everywhere. D in the deep south, as well as in the north. Some out in the east. <clears throat> and we did it because of this verse. Where's the wise? We're here to debate. Where's the wise? Where's the scribe? Who are those who are writing all the books? Give us, give us your intellect. Give us your best intellect. Give us the people that are writing all your textbooks. Give us your great debaters of this age. Because we believed, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? We believed it with all of our heart. And we went and debated. You know what we preached? The gospel. All day long. All day long. All night long. Gave invitations to be saved. Then had Bible study to those who got saved. We were driven by that passage. Send us. Send us out. Thank us to the people that are wise and scribes and debaters who think that we have a foolish message. Let's just go argue it. But know that they're going to consider us morons. <laughs> you guys don't have all the degrees we have. What books have you written? What, what kind of, what's this, what's that? Nothing. I have nothing. But the Bible. And it was already written, thank God. And that comes from Isaiah. And the background to Isaiah 29 is phenomenal. I wish I had time to preach on that. Why did he, of all the places of the Old Testament, why did he pick the book of Isaiah 29? Oh, hey. <laughs> oh. that's really good for what was going on in the first century. In Israel. Oh. But you know you noted the four questions. The first three questions were to the wise men who assumed falsely that worldly wisdom was necessary to find spiritual truth. And this was a truth for the first century AD Jews and Greeks. And Paul talks about that. We see it when we study the Bible. For example, Jesus talks to Nicodemus in the third chapter of John, where the famous, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son is found. He was talking to an elite wisdom of the world, wise guy, a wise guy, a wise guy called Nicodemus, a man who was a scholar of the law. Then we meet Saul of Tarsus, who was equally that smart. They were examples of these Jews of the day of the first century. You can read about it in John 3 and Acts 22. The city of Athens is a good example of the Greeks' wisdom. Paul got into Athens, this great university town, the Auburn and Tuscaloosa of the ancient world, the Harvard and Yale, all these, this type of schools that are elites. And he was overwhelmed by the fact that they believed in so many gods of the world. They were collecting all the gods of the world and not to insult any other god, 
they had a statue to the unknown God that caught, caught Paul's attention. And so he had some fun with them by telling them he knew he, they were right in to put a statue up of the unknown God, but he knew the name of the unknown God. And he preached the gospel around that statue of the unknown God because the unknown God to those people was the son of God that had come to become the great purchaser of the soul of humanity, not only for the city of Athens, but for all the cities of the world. A wonderful study of Acts 17 for you. Space, pay special attention, however, to the last question and the answer. Notice that the last question was, has God... Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Did you notice that the answer was in verse 20? And, be, and on from 20 to 25. In worldly wisdom, death normally frustrates and disrupts human plans. Would you agree with that? All of a sudden, look. I, my stepfather electrical engineer and did really good in life. Saved up all of his pennies. I mean, he was just a smart guy. Jew, really smart. Um, really a smart business guy. And he accumulated a small fortune. And his great plans was to work, uh, earn, get enough stored <laughs> You know, kept building barns and storing so that he could retire young and just do what he wanted to do because he'd have the finances to do it. Right? I mean, th that's the way a lot of us approach it. I, I, you know, I, I, I don't care. But that was his approach. He retired and had about one year of that before he come critically ill. And Jane, I'm thinking maybe... Maybe within five years he was dead. What do you think, bud? I, I lose time after a while. Jane, are you with me? <laughs> I, how, how, many, how long do you think bud lived after he came down with critical illness before he died? Do you think, how many years would that be? No idea. No idea, okay. It wasn't long, but never got to do any of it. Never got to do any of it. So... When I, when I make this, step, I think about these things. And I've seen a lot of this happen. By now, you've lived long enough to see this happen in other people's lives. In worldly wisdom, death normally frustrates and disrupts human plans. But not so with the plan of God. You know why? Because life goes on. <laughs> you die? Your plans just began. Whatever you thought was going to be the vacation of your life has, been gone, has just gone lights out. I mean, it's bigger than anything you could have ever possibly imagined going to heaven. <laughs> Whatever you thought would be the trip of your life on your bucket list, the number one big thing, heaven would be lights out compared to that. 1 Corinthians one twenty three. Third, God has provided every church-age believer, such as you and I sitting here today, with a grace system for learning the wisdom of God, regardless of his or her, listen to me, IQ or educational background. Now I got to start, I have two star students in this, in this room right now. And they know that I'm telling them the truth. I have Suzanne, and I have Jackie. And they're living proof of this. They are living proof of this. Just because you, just because you didn't score lights out on an IQ or go to college and get some big degree, don't mean you're a moron. You know you're smart. But listen, sometimes you say, well, I'm smart in the ways of the world. That's okay. I'm pretty smart with people. That's okay. Listen, you know, you know what you're telling me? 
you're pretty smart. You know it and I know it. Once you get saved, you can learn everything in that Bible. The Holy Spirit takes up res the third member of the Godhead takes up residence inside your body. You become, be, your body becomes a mobile church, right? The Holy Spirit is with you, John 14, 6, forever. When you show up, you can have church. <laughs> My uncle used to come down and visit us. He lived up to two or three houses up from us. He'd come down, and after he got saved, he'd come down to have church. He'd come down. He used to come down and just eat whatever Jane had made. Then he started coming down, one studied the Bible with us. Then he called it church. Nothing could have been more true in all the whole wide world. We had church. Listen, we always have church. Because God, the Holy Spirit, lives in us and makes our body a mobile church. I mean, I'm always open to have church, aren't you? Somebody come in. They want to sit down and talk about, about the Bible, the Lord, whatever. We have church in a heartbeat. <laughs> have church. God has provided everything. Listen, you know how smart you are? You got saved by believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the smartest, wisest decision you could have ever made in your entire life. Because God's gonna, God is going to walk you through this life through the valley and the shadow of death. He's going to walk with you. He's never going to leave you nor forsake you. He's going to walk you right out of this deal into something you could have never dreamed possible called heaven. Oh, my goodness. And all of it's by grace, through faith, and not of yourself. It is a gift. I believe that with all my heart. There's a little pamphlet that we have we give out to people. I don't know if we have any down here. But I have some in the, I have some down here somewhere. I mean, if somewhere. But if you want one after church, see me. Fifty thing pamphlet that lists fifty things that you can never lose. That you get in salvation, you can never lose in time and eternity. Never lose them. Fifty things you can never lose. At the moment of salvation, he gives you these fifty things. Eight of them are called the work of the Holy Spirit, and I listed them on your paper. And you can study them. But one of those is the indwelling teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit that's going on tonight. In 2 Peter 3.18, he says, grow in grace and, what's the other word? Knowledge. Grow in grace and in knowledge. And listen, they both go together. That's why they're put there. They both go together. They both go together. John 14, 6, 16, 26, John 15, 8, 9, 26, 27, John 16, 5 through 16, 33, 1 John 2, 26, 27, all talk about the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer, church-age believer. This is what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life. You should read that and let him do this. He is in your life. Not just to, not, not just to carry him around like he's a baby like you're pregnant, he's a baby. He's a full-grown, living, dynamic God that wants to, th wants to have ministry to you and through you. You need to read these passages and study them and allow that ministry to break out, to become full-blown and break out in you. You want revival? Quit looking outside yourself. Start looking inside yourself, and you'll find revival. And once you find revival, you will find it move to other people. Revival is all about other people. But it's never going to reach other people if it don't reach you first. You need to read this. You need to see what he's ready to do in your life, just in the teaching aspect. He's willing to do everything. He's willing to empower your life in ways you could never imagine. <laughs> Aren't you glad you came tonight? Well, thank you. Now, here's my final point. Paul showed that both the Jew, who were biblically religious, and the Greeks, who were pagan religionists, 
considered the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to be foolishness. Over on this side, you've got religion, which is called pagan by the Jews. <laughs> but they're on the same side. Because they reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. The only thing that can get you from here over to here is that Christ died, was buried, and raised from the dead. And when you believe it, you get saved. Yeah, I hear people all the time. People go like, I talk to some people about it. And they, Where do you go to church? I didn't go to church. How is that possible? I don't go to church anywhere. Why, why don't you go to church? Well, he wants my money, and oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I said, why don't you go to church? I said, no. Why don't you go to church? He said, well, I don't see what you, I tell you, I told you three times. I said, you haven't told me anything. You've blamed everybody else. I see the finger pointing out at everything. I don't see it pointing in. I ask you, why don't you go to church? You've made excuses. You've blamed everybody about why you don't. Tell me the truth. Quit, quit trying to dance around me. All I'm asking is a simple question. Why don't you go to church? Every time you point your finger, that's not telling me anything. That's blaming everybody. That's excusing it. That's excusing bad behavior. Tell me why. Tell me the truth. Eh, that's, that's not let him off the hook. When you get the hook in him, you, you keep that fish. The, Mr. Farmer says, you got to keep the line. Keep it tight. I'm not going to let him off the hook. I'm going to look. stick your finger out and tell me that's why you don't go. That's not the truth. You think that's going to push me away. If you don't want to tell me, you can walk away. But listen, I'm asking you a question you ain't told me yet. If you don't want to tell me, that's fine. I'll sit back down here and drink a cup of coffee and study my Bible. But don't blow smoke in my face. You ain't told me nothing. You told me nothing. Okay. Listen, it's right there. Caruso. Caruso. Being prepared to go to the public square where people think that you're a moron because your message is foolish. But it's not. It's just the opposite. It's full of power. It's full of truth. It combats lies and all that. We struggle and fight for people's souls. When you read the Ambassador Creed, when you read the Ambassador Creed that we're all under of 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21, you know what Paul says? We beg you on behalf of Christ. We beg you on behalf of Christ to become saved by grace through faith and not of yourself as gift. We beg you on behalf of Christ. I'm not going to let the fish off the hook. I care more for his soul than he could ever care for it. I care more for his soul than he could ever care for it. That's why I'm in the public arena. I don't have to know the whole Bible. I have to know the gospel really clear, though. I have to believe that is the it, the gospel is the power of God into salvation. The gospel is the power of God into salvation to everyone who believes, Romans 1.16. 1 Corinthians 1, 22, 23. For indeed, Jews ask for a sign. The Greeks seek for wisdom. But we preach in the public square, Caruso, Christ crucified. To the Jew, it's a stumbling block. To the Gentiles, foolishness. That's their first response. I'm still going to sow it as long as they'll listen. I'm going to tell them the truth about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if they believe, they will know. The next day, they will be with me. 
I can't tell you how many people would get saved. We'd put them into Bible study that night. The next morning, they would be out there with us. Encouraging others to believe. Locals, university kids, local people. You need to listen to this guy. My life got changed last night. You need to listen to this guy. Didn't we all have that when we got saved? And we rush back to tell our friends, the people we love the dearest, of, about this message of the gospel of Jesus Christ who changed people's lives. It just changed mine, huh? But listen, they consider it foolishness. They think you're a moron. That's okay. It doesn't matter. We beg you on behalf of Christ. We beg you on behalf of Christ. I'm more concerned. Listen, of course I'm more concerned for their soul. I'm an ambassador. They don't have any concern for their soul until the gospel is sown. Wisdom of the world is meritorious. Either as good works or, or, or and accumulation of wisdom of the world. While the wisdom of God is non-meritorious, saved by grace through faith. The wisdom of the world concludes, the wisdom of the world concludes that the grace gospel is a message of foolishness and the weakness of God. That's in our passage. It is finite, imperfect men calling an infinite, perfect God foolish. Who's the moron? See? Doesn't do any good to call either one of them. But to those who are no verb called, Romans 8, 28, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And we all know that if been saved. We know that. But the world doesn't. The world doesn't. We need to be Caruso's. We need to be ambassadors of Christ. Go to the public square and share the gospel the truth of the gospel. Then bring them here. We'll teach them. Then bring them here. Bring them here. Uh, let's have a word of prayer and we'll let the internet off. Father, we're thankful tonight for these come our way by the automobile and the internet. Pray today, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the word of God throughout the airwaves as well as the heart waves. We're in a war. We need to be soldiers. Put on the full armor of God. Pick up the sword, the spirit of truth. <clears throat> the word of God, categorically taught, like the gospel. Power of God into salvation to everyone who believes. I pray that true tonight, that they people wouldn't just throw this off. We beg you on behalf of Christ to be saved, to believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead to give you life everlasting. You can take that bucket list and throw it away. That bucket list doesn't matter anymore because when you die, you're going to heaven. In the meantime, become an ambassador for Christ. Take the gospel to the highways and the hedges. There are a lot of people want to hear it. I can tell you that. That's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.